as things that I've learned from the life of Moses. And we've been talking about it. We're on, we did up to 25 last week. And these are just kind of fun things that I've found that refer to the care, refer to the character of Moses. And now, if, if you think this is, you know, different, then I want, I want to remind you of something. Moses wrote these books. Moses is telling on himself. Moses is saying, you know, um, I stutter. I don't, you know, please send somebody else. He becomes, and you can see as he's telling the story, he's, he's actually changing and growing and becoming what, what all that God has for him. It's pretty exciting to be able to see. So these are fun things that Moses told on himself. And so we're going to take a look at those tonight. And, um, and, and, and I think it'll be a lot of fun for us. So here we go. For the very, the, the number 26. So um, this is what we look at. Everything is God's, right? But not everything is given over to him. So we have to ask ourselves some questions. For example, everything is the Lord's, but has everything been placed into God's hands? That's the real question. Because you might have something that really irritates your life. And I've learned in my, in my life, everything that gets between God and I becomes a pretty big irritation. And anything that I allow between the Lord and myself just becomes a problem in the long run. You might think it's a car, you might think it's a relationship, but everything that gets between the Lord and myself can become a problem in the long run. And, um, and please know that when God calls you to love him first, <laughs> he's really enabling you to love everybody else that much more because there's times when our love and our care just don't, can't make it all the way through. So we're going to take a look back at this, at these verses tonight. And uh, here we go. Share, you know, share the share button and the end meeting button are that far apart. So it's kind of scary sometimes. So Exodus 13, one through 12, it says, the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. Now, we won't get into the whole male female thing but we'll get an idea as we go on in, in these things that we learned from moses what he was doing and what he was talking about and why did he have that on his mind consecrate to me every firstborn male the first offspring of every one womb among the israelites belongs to me whether man or animal now this is important we'll talk about this in a minute um, and there's a point to, to what's going on here. And then it says, in, uh, in going on, skipping down to verse 11 through 13, it says, After the Lord brings you into the, into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you as he promised on oath to you and your forefathers, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem um, with a lamb, every firstborn donkey, and if you do not redeem it, break its neck. In other words, God says, this is a really big priority to me. Give whatever's the first to, back to me. And so it, it uses a word there called redeem. And that word redeem means to buy it back. And why is that important? Because it's his, you know, and it's very important that we understand that tithing, giving, you're, you're not like, oh, well, let me see what I have to give the Lord. It's already his. He says in his word, it's mine. And so it's very important that we understand that he's saying, acknowledge that that is mine. And so we get to that main point. Everything is the Lord's, but not everything has been given to him. And so um, I've learned in my life, whatever I have that um, I have not given over to the Lord is 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 going to be a problem in my life. And so it's very important. So we, we have to ask ourselves, uh, you know, a pretty big question here. Is there something in our lives that we haven't given over to the Lord? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 through 20, talk about our lives. It says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. <laughs> Once there was this um, 
gal smoking pot <laughs> in San Francisco, and she's reading her Bible, you know? And it, she, <laughs> a friend of mine is witnessing to her, he goes, hey, what are you doing? And she goes, well, I'm worshiping the Lord. <laughs> and he goes, but you're, you're getting stoned at the same time. And by the way, just in case you don't know it, in the book of Revelations, it talks about experiences with God on drugs. That's a no-no because he's got other ways of speaking to us and he doesn't want it to be some sort of astral projection kind of a thing. So she, her response was, well, I know it's not right, but in my body, I'm sinning. But in my spirit, I'm worshiping God. So we're going to talk about that actually this Sunday, this Sunday, because you can't separate the two. In fact, what we do in our body affects us in our spirit. It's very important we understand that. So we've been bought with a price. We have to honor God with our body. So we have to ask some questions of ourselves. What are some things possibly in my life that God has laid claim to? You know, you might think, well, what's he want that for? I mean... He wants my old car? Well, why does he want my old car? You know, well, he doesn't want your car. He wants your rights to that car. That car maybe becomes his and you become the manager of it. And so it's very important. We talked about Sunday. It says one of the reasons why God hates divorce is because he wants to raise up children for him. And we see so many problems in society because kids come from broken homes. And so this is really important that we see this because God puts a claim on there. And so we, we have people who say things like, let me get out of the screen and, and, and here we go. So we have, we have some things where we say, but I have dreams, pastor. I, I have a dream to, to win an Oscar and be an actor. Yeah, no, no yeah, you know, just, yeah, yeah, just maybe other things. Well, I have dreams and thoughts that, that, that I have, but I want, I want to tell you something. I am so grateful that I gave up my rights to those dreams. You know, serving God is maybe not the easiest thing in the world sometimes, but it's <laughs> doing things my own way are a whole lot worse. It's way more complicated, and it, there's a lot more issues when it comes to that. So I'm not my own. According to that scripture, it says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Honor God with your body. And all of my desires, every time I've had a desire on the carnal side of my life, it's gotten me into trouble. And so it's very important that we understand that, that we cannot have, um, we cannot just live by our carnal desires. We have to go to the Lord and make sure that my desires are his desires, and I have to give up those things. And, and here he says, the firstborn child. You know, what's up with that? He wants us to raise our children for him. And starting with the first child, starting with our kids, to influence their lives for him. And it's really important. And it's important that we learn that. And, and we do our best to invest in our kids' spiritual life. Now, you might go, well, you know, Pastor, I'm doing my best to raise my kids. I'm making sure that they do all the sports that they, and, and they're in the drama club at church, you know, not at church, but at school, they do this and they have all these things. But what are they, what are you raising them out of your spiritual life? And that's important that that become a part of what's going on in your life, in your heart. So we look at that and we, we go, wow, that's, I need to, I need to look at some things that maybe have irritated me that actually God is saying, those are mine. I want you to honor the Lord with those things. So um, very important. So number um, 27. <laughs> I love the character studies. And here we go. Um, 27, we'll go right there. And it says, there are times when God will ask you to take a step of faith. And so it's very important. Before someone says, I'm going to be a missionary to some place, and that's what God's called me to do. I remember when I was a youth pastor, um, preached, and this um, gal in her mid-20s came up, and she said, I'm ready. God has spoken to me, pastor. I said, you're ready for what? She says, 
I'm ready to give my life for missions. And I said, what about your kids? <laughs> she goes, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll give them up for the Lord. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> your husband oh yeah you know i'm gonna i'm just focused in on me and me serving god well it, it doesn't work that way so there are steps and times when god will ask you to take a step of faith but we're gonna look a little bit about that today how we're doing on time we're doing okay so exodus 14 10 through 16 it says as moses approached um, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching down on them. They were terrified, and they cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, I love the Israelites at this point in time, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? <laughs> um, what have we done? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Did we... Uh, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the desert. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. Um, the Lord will bring you, the Lord will bring to you, bring you today. And it says the Egyptians will see that uh, you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Moses is trying to, you know, conjure up some courage, you know, be firm, be strong. And then verse 15, he tells on himself and he says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Uh, Lord, you know, there's a, there's a, there's the ocean right there. <laughs> it says, raise your staff, stretch it out over the sea. and." Over, those, over the sea to divide the waters so the Israelites can go through the sea to the dry ground. Now, I, I heard all kinds of historical things. It ah, really happened like that. Guess what? If God wanted to evaporate the oceans for five seconds, he could. He could do that. And so it's very important that we understand that God is able to do those kind of things. And it's really important that we understand what's taking place here. And so I, I want to encourage you um, this evening. Sometimes God will ask you to do some things, just like Amanda shared with us. Sometimes God will ask you to do some things that don't make a lot of sense. But in the spiritual world, it does. And sometimes we do things, and, it, and, and sometimes we don't even hear about the full effects of what we're doing and why we're doing it until way later. And so we trust the Lord. We put those things and we say, okay, I'm going to take a step of faith and move out in this. And, and God honors us. He will. He'll honor our steps of faith. But, but I want you to keep in mind here. Um, it's one thing for you to take a step of faith, but you've got to think about your kids, your children, and remember those who are under your realm of influence. It's got to be agreed upon. When God called um, my family to missionary service in Chile, um, one of the first people that heard the Lord even before me was my wife. And Secondly, after I felt the Lord speak to my heart, and my wife says, it's about time, then God spoke to my daughter. And so I just want you to know something. God will speak to your whole family. And so just make sure it's God. Don't run off and do things marching into the ocean until you know that something's God. And he's able to do it. God just told them, go forward. And as they move forward, and things begin to take place in the the wind moved and God stepped in. An amazing, powerful thing took place. It's just, uh, I would have, I want to see that when I get to heaven. I just think, how did he do it? I see all these special effects on camera and I don't even think it comes close to it. <laughs> so here we go. The next thing that we look at tonight is this. And it says, um, and number 28. And we talked a little bit about this, and it says, step out in faith and praise, and others will follow. Sometimes people go, I don't, I don't want to raise my hands in worship, because if, if, if I do that, then they'll all look at me. Well, who cares? You know, really, you're honoring the Lord. You're worshiping Him. You just need to go for it. And, you know, I remember times of going out and doing street ministry. I just began to worship the Lord. And, 
close my eyes, get my get my eyes off everybody else, and, and I was able to see what, what what took place there. Now, our our verse that we have there in Exodus chapter fifteen, verses one through twenty one, is a amazing thing because Moses breaks out in this sense of praise and worship. It's prophetic. It's powerful. It says, "I will sing unto the Lord, for He is highly exalted." The horse and its rider he is hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He's my God and I will praise him. He's my father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. The Pharaoh's chariots and his armies he's hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers have drowned into the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. Keep in mind that it wasn't just a six inches of water, you know, deep waters there, it says right there, have covered them. They sank into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, your majestic power, your right hand, O Lord, has shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who oppressed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stungle, stubble. The blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up, the surging waters the, um, stood firm like a wall. <laughs> I mean, think about casting it, sorry. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoil. So we're, we could go on, verse 11, who among the gods is like you? Who is like you in the majestic in the holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? We can read through that whole chapter, and I just encourage you to do that, just read someone else's praise. You might think, well, what do I have to praise the Lord about? Well, you might need to praise God for something that God's doing in somebody else's life. The Bible says, weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. And you might need to, to take a, a moment and just thank God for what he's doing in somebody else's life. So it's very important that we do that. And uh, that was my for letting me know that it's seeing something outside. And then um, I, I, I wanna share with you, last but not least, Miriam, she steps out and she begins to worship. And it says, verse 20, it says that Miriam um, steps out, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, Moses' sister as well, took a tambourine in her hand and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Uh, Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, he is highly exalted. It's horse and his rider has he hurled into the sea. Now, Miriam's song is about this big. Moses' song is about this big. Why is that important? Because sometimes when people praise God, they don't sound just like you. They might be louder. They might have a whole song. They might have lots of words. They might have a lot more expression. Um, Miriam's was the short version, but it was the same God, same miracle, same excitement. And uh, Moses, it's very interesting in that whole line of praise and worship. Moses doesn't mention himself once. The previous chapter, he says, and God honored his servant Moses, you know? And so you get this idea of what's taking place right there all the way through that praise. His full attention is on the Lord and what God's done. And that's just exciting. We, we need that in our lives. And so very, very important that we see that. And then we come to um, the next one right here. Let's see if we click the wrong thing. There we go. And we see this. And it says, the normal... Um, the stick is miraculous in God's hands. In uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 22 through 27, it says, Then Moses led Israel into the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled into the desert without finding water. And when they came to um, Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. And that's why the, the place is called Marah. The people grumbled against the Lord. What are we to drink? And, the, and Moses cried out to the Lord. It's very... We could do a whole study about Moses talking to God and the people complaining to Moses. And, you know, we should never let somebody else talk to God for us. Moses cried out to the Lord. The Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There, the Lord made a decree and a law for them. He tested them right, um, right in his, excuse me, and it says, He said to them, if you're careful, listen to the voice of the Lord your God. And, um, excuse me, and do what is right in his eyes. If you pay attention to his command 
and keep his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. I mean, they had just left Israel, uh, Egypt, and, and it says, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. And it's very interesting that we see what takes place here, because it says the Lord tested them. They were there, and they, they got tested. And so I I, I, I want to ask you a question and I just let you think about that. Um, you might go, there's not much in my life. I don't have a lot going on in my life. Well, just just hang on for a second. Just just wait for a second because you might just be that stick. <laughs> you might go, oh, I am is just, you know, I'm just an old stick in the mud. Well, guess what? God wants to use you, you old stick in the mud, and use you in a powerful way. God threw that stick into the water, and the waters became sweet. And I know that that's symbolic for us, because that stick is the cross, you know, that place where Jesus comes in, and he ministers in the middle of a bitter situation. Now, think for a moment, the most bitterest situation in your life. And that cross comes in, Jesus ministers sweetness to our lives. Maybe you've been through some really dark times in your life, and Jesus comes in and he ministers life to you. It's so important that we understand that, that God wants to minister life and minister and bring sweetness to our life. Uh, I, I just think that that sweetness of the, of the cross being thrown in, the sweetness of what God wants to do in our lives to encourage us to, to, to bless. And out of that, boy, great things take place in our lives. And so in the middle of bitterness, and isn't it interesting that that bitter, nasty water, it was stagnant. And sometimes things are stagnant in our lives. You know, it's the same thing every day. You know, sometimes with that stagnant in our lives, we allow the cross to come in and he brings that living water back into us. And the living water means it's not just sitting there, it's flowing in. And it's really important that we see that. I, I was amazing for me to see the Dead Sea. And that, why is it the Dead Sea? Because it's got the Jordan coming in and nothing going out. And the water and minerals just keep building in there and it becomes more and more nasty and stagnant. And eventually all the minerals come in there and you don't even get algae growing in there. Amazing thing, I've never quite floated like that in my life and it was a great time. So just to encourage you. And, and the other thing that the Lord does in the middle of that situation, he makes himself known. He says, I am the Lord that heals you. I am the Lord that healeth you. I am the healer God. And that name for God right there is Jehovah Rapha. The, he, the God that heals. And he says, you listen to my voice and do what is right in his eye. Pay full attention. It says, I will bring none of those diseases that I brought on the Egyptians. And I'm so grateful that God has promised us that kind of healing, that cross comes, gets put into our lives. And it, I, I, I won't go on to the next thing about the, the, you know, the, the, the next time that they complained, but I will say this. Isn't it interesting that sometimes after a test, God will give us a place of rest. And they come to that place where those, the, there's the palms, there's the water, and there's that place that they camp there by the water. What an amazing thing. I love camping near water because it's just the refreshing sound. It's a beautiful thing that we can have that kind of refreshing that's going on there. And then we come to the very last thing today, and it's number 30. And um, here we go to share that screen. Um, number 30 is this, and it says, it doesn't matter how much God is with you, you're still going to need some help. <laughs> Exodus chapter 17, verses, 18 th verses 8 through 16 says, the Amalekites came and attacked Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. Moses and Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands and the Israelites were winning, whenever he lowered his hands down, you know, I remember gym class, you know, put your hands out in front of you, you know, and you're, 
you know, and you'd see the guys lowering their hands. Well, this is Moses, and they're not talking all day long, all day long. This, and it's so they're winning, and the Amalekites are winning, and Moses' hands grew tired. They took a stone and they put it up, and they, and he sat on him. Aaron and her held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, and his hands remained steady into sunset. And so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. The Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll, something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. Joshua won the battle and God says, make sure that Joshua hears this because it's pretty important to know that sometimes God says, hey, you're going to need some help. Moses couldn't go out and fight the battle. Moses couldn't hold up his own arms. Moses needed some help. So just remember, even though God's with you and some amazing things are taking place, it's very important that you learn to know that you need some help. And um, and it, the Lord is my banner. That's where God reveals. He called, made an altar, called it the Lord is my banner, you know. And and I think there they could also say that the Lord is our banner because of the great things that took God did right there. His hands were lifted up to the throne of God. The Lord will be at war with the Amalekites from generation to generation. He sent them out. And, and, and we come to that time of Jesus. Jesus didn't go, you. You, right there, you, you're, you're going to be, um, you're, you're going to be that lone prophet all by yourself. You, right there, I see you, yeah, I see you watching. You're going to be a prophet all by yourself. You know, it, that's just not New Testament. New Testament is, he sent them out two by twos, he sent them out in huge groups, he sent out the disciples, he had a team of people with him, and so we get this idea of a team. So, how how does that work? Well, if you have one horse that can pull, um, I believe it is 1,500 pounds of dead weight, and another horse that can pull about 1,500 pounds of dead weight, guess what happens when you put the two together? They pull a lot more, close to 4,000 pounds of dead weight, because two work a lot stronger than two people separate. And so it's very important that we understand that, that we understand that, that idea, that concept, no matter how much you think God's with you, you're still going to need some help. And if you don't mind for a second, I want to just take for a moment and just say, I want to praise God for the team that we have at church, the worship team, those of you who filled in and, and the board that we had. I had a board member meeting Monday night. I had such a blast. It took me like two hours to go to sleep. Because I had fun. I had fun with those guys. I'm so grateful for Kathy Matheson. I know you're out there somewhere. We'll try to make sure that you hear this. So grateful for her and her help with the finances and the and getting things together. Because, man, I, I need all the help I can get. And, and I so appreciate all of you who have joined in together to make sure that we as a church function together. Um, I Even tonight, I remembered halfway through this, <laughs> the thing I wrote, I forgot to pray again. You know, I got all these things going on. Um, I I don't see Bart here. Um, you know, so maybe that's what happened. I needed Bart to go. You forgot to pray, and so it's. It, I want you to know something. I I think the Lord's with us as a church, but we still need help. We still need each other, and it's an amazing thing that. In the body of Christ, when you pull it all together, you don't get the strength of 10. You get the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. For where two are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And he's not talking about like that he just showed up, that there's that sense of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit when we work together. And it's a powerful, powerful thing. So really important for us to just to go through for a moment, to do a quick review on this. So. Um, first thing is everything is God's, but not everything is given over to him. So ask yourself a question. Are there areas in your life, let's just say that old pickup that always gives you headaches, have you given it to the Lord? Have you found out what God wants you to do with that truck? Give it to God and submit it to the Lord. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a situation and you say, God, I consecrate and I give this to you. I want this to be yours and not mine, and you give it over to him. And then 27, there are times when God will ask you to take a step of faith. Sometimes it won't make a sense. I have a, a, a prayer request that I'm gonna share with you. Um, have this guy named Eduardo, they call him El Gordo. El Gordo is not very 
um, heavy anymore. He's got cancer. He's on his last days. He's ready to go be with Jesus, but I'm going to tattle on him. And if I, I don't think he can hear this nor understand because he doesn't speak English, but man, we were at a real discouraging point when we were building the church in Chile. And we did it. We said, we want to see that everybody in church involved with it. He gave the sweetest looking old Peugeot to the church to sell. And I want you to know something. I never saw him without a car. <laughs> God did an amazing thing with it. So there are times when God will ask you to do a step of faith. And I'm, I'm not asking you for the church. God might ask you to do something to bless somebody else. And so keep that in mind. Um, and in praise, maybe in worship. When we get back together and we do corporate praise, please make sure that your motor has been idling and that you're ready to worship God. I, I'm believing God, one of the best times of worship when we get together corporately and we begin to worship God together. And just don't worry about everybody watching you. Just think, hey, you know, um, I'm just going to worship the Lord and, and let's just see what takes place. Um, and then we skip down just a little bit. Number 29, remember that stick? You might be that stick. And, um, and sometimes we take the cross and we put it in the most bitter area of our life. And we give it to the Lord and we ask God to do something with it. And he'll, he puts the cross in the most bitterest situations and he changes it and it turns it into a sweet situation. I don't know if you've been used, abused, or hurt. But you place the cross in the middle of that. You, you take your relationship with Jesus in the middle of that situation, and God will do some amazing, amazing things. And then last but not least, I don't care how much God's with you, you you're going to need some help. And I need help. You need help. We need, we need the body of Christ. And again, I'm so grateful for every one of you and what God's doing in our fellowship. Please keep in mind as we pray for our church and as God begins to prepare us for these next few days that God does some those amazing things that only he can do. Well, I see that it is um, 742. I started way early with the hopes of y'all being able to fellowship together and connect together a little bit. Um, but please don't feel like, you know, I got to be there. Yeah, I got to talk to people. But, you know, sometimes texting is just not as easy for some as it is for others, but you know, just know um, I've been with the board. They are a lot of fun. And some of you, I really look forward to hanging out with. Um, you're, you're a lot more fun than you get yourselves credit for. And God's going to do some amazing and powerful things through you and through our church as people begin to step out in faith and see what he wants to do. Let's go to the Lord. Let's take these things to the Lord. Father, first and foremost, we come to you and Lord, if we have any area in our life that we haven't turned over, areas that you have rights to, maybe, maybe we play an instrument, maybe we're able to do things that we didn't think that we could do, but we can do. Father, I pray that you'd help us to give those things over to you. Maybe it's our children, Father, if we would take time and have our children dedicated, that we would ourselves would give our children back over to you. And it's a serious thing because you said whatever we don't retreat, redeem, whatever we don't take back ourselves, break its neck. Don't, don't either give it to the Lord or don't. And it's a serious thing. And I pray that you would help us to, to know that you've called us and you've put our hand, your hand on our lives. Help us to do that, Lord Jesus. And, and Lord, we also lift before you um, our desire to, to, our need to be able to step out in faith, Father. I pray that as, as people are discouraged, as people have withdrawn so much lately, help them to step out in faith. I don't know with what or with how, but God, help them to step out in faith, Lord Jesus. And then prepare us, Father. Prepare us, Lord Jesus, for worship when we come back together. And we just thank you, God, that we're going to have a blast just being together and worshiping you together. Put it in people's hearts and minds that they need to prepare and idle their motor up a little bit to worship you, Lord Jesus. And then we come to that place of, of also recognizing that, Father, that, that there's normal, and you're looking to use the normal. You're going to take that normal stick, the cross, and you're going to put it into our lives in the most bitterest area, if we'll let you, and you'll turn it into a sweet thing, Lord. And then last but not least, Father, you come into our hearts and our lives, and you 
you want us to remember that you're trying to build a team. You're trying to build a church and help us, Father, first and foremost, to make sure we're on your team, that we make ourselves available and help us to see what, God, you can do with us. And thank you, Lord, that that which you've begun to do in, in a church, you're going to bring it through to completion because you have a vision and a goal of all of us working together and seeing what you can do. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do and what you're going to accomplish. Be with everybody. Help us to be prepared for Sunday. And we're just excited about all that you're going to do, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye.